Sometimes lawyers will represent two or more defendants or two or more plaintiffs in litigation. And this can create different types of problems, especially when you get to the end of the case and the parties are ready to settle or they're talking about settling and your own clients or co-clients disagree about whether to settle or for how much they should settle or how the settlement will be divided up. This comes up in Model Rule 1.7 when we talk about checking for conflicts and getting informed consent before you even undertake the representation. But we also have a standalone rule that really pertains to the end of the representation when this situation actually yeah, it comes up or presents itself. And that's 1.8G. That's what we're going to be talking about here. I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. Let's dive in. 1.8G begins, a lawyer who represents two or more clients shall not participate in making an aggregate settlement of the claims of or against the clients or in a criminal case, an aggregated agreement as to a guilty or nolo contendere plea, unless, and then we're going to have um, a big unless here, unless each client gives informed consent in a writing signed by the client. Now, remember under 1.7, we had informed consent confirmed in writing. Pay attention for test purposes to where the MP, the model rules actually require not only that something is in writing, but that the client add their signature to it as confirmation. And this is one of those rules where we have a signature requirement in addition to a writing requirement. Now, the lawyer it continues that the lawyer's disclosure has to include the existence and nature of all the claims or pleas involved and of the participation of each person in the settlement. So if you have co-plaintiffs and so the other side is offering to pay an award, a settlement amount, then they have to know who, everybody's claim, if anybody has um, their share affected by contributory negligence or something like that, and how that is going to be divided up. And in other lectures I mentioned, they could have disagreements because maybe one of them has an urgent need. They had lots and lots of expensive medical bills and they're facing bankruptcy and so forth. Uh, and so they are feel like their medical bills should be paid. But another person, maybe they've lost their ability to to return to work at their career. And so they're going to be unemployed for an extended period. And so they could end up disagreeing about who deserves a larger share or who should get paid first and so forth. So keep that in mind. The same with defendants. If you have co-defendants, it's going to turn out that they disagree about who should, um, who is more at fault or who should really pay the, um, what share of the bill. So that should be obvious at the beginning of the representation and at the end, Everyone has to know. So don't play any games where you try to say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you an amount and you tell me if that amount is acceptable to you and don't worry about anyone else. That may be, sound like a nice way to make the peace, but you're not allowed to do that. Everyone else has to know what everyone else is paying or receiving. So let's go back to our slides here. The ABA also put out an ethics opinion about this that um, I think gives even more clarity, especially for test purposes, and you need to know this, this could come up on the MPRE. In seeking the consent of multiple clients to an aggregate settlement, a lawyer must advise each client of, number one, the total settlement amount, number two, the nature and amount of each client's participation, the fees and costs to be paid to the lawyer, and how those costs will be apportioned to each client. So I set this up as a little checklist um, for you to keep in mind that at, when you're in practice, every client needs to have all of these pieces of information. And if you get a test question hypothetical, everybody needs uh, to know all of these. You, the lawyer is not allowed to hide or obfuscate any of these items. Now, we're going to have another rule we cover in my course, Rule 1.2, um, which is about the scope of authority or allocation of authority between the lawyer and the client. And 1.2a protects each client's right to have a final say in deciding whether to accept or reject an offer of settlement. In other words, 
one of the clients could veto the agreement or the arrangement for their share. Now, sometimes if they if they had different lawyers, they could break up and one could settle settle independently of the others. But if they if you are representing them together, essentially this is saying that each one has veto power over the settlement for the rest of them. And the same is going to be true for guilty pleas in criminal cases. Comment 16 to Rule 1.8 says that the risk of eventual disagreement about settlement should have been discussed before undertaking the representation. That's part of the informed consent confirmed in writing under 1.7 um, as part of the process of obtaining the client's informed consent. Now, you may be wondering, what about class action lawsuits where you might have thousands and thousands of class members? Well, the ABA has said that lawyers representing a class of plaintiffs or defendants do not have a full uh, client-lawyer relationship with each member of the class, at least for purposes of conflicts of interest. So you still have to comply with applicable rules. There's a number of procedural rules um, and notification requirements for if you do a class action lawsuit where you have to publish notice or provide um, direct notice to each member of the class, but you don't have to get consent from every member of a class. Here's a quick review question to see if you've been paying attention. Let's say a lawyer represents co-defendants in a civil lawsuit um, a, that's a corporation and one of its managers, like an employee, and uh, the company is paying the lawyer's fees. The plaintiff offers to settle for a modest amount. The company really wants to settle, but the employee wants to be vindicated at a public trial. How should the lawyer respond? A, the lawyer should wait to get a consensus decision, or B, the lawyer should do what the corporation wants because they're paying the lawyer's fees. I hope you know the answer to that. If you're not sure, you should take a few minutes and rewatch this video because um, that's important or you may have missed the whole point and weren't paying attention. That concludes our discussion of 1.8G. We'll continue with another video talking about 1.8H.